Hello, my name is Jordanis Kerenidis. I am the head of Al International for UCWare. And today I will be talking to you about the collaboration between QCWare and IonQ on a classification on a quantum computer. I will be giving the first part of the talk. So what we want to do in quantum computing is find these real world applications. And to do that, we have to work on both sides, both from the hardware and from the software. So for example, IonQ is, is uh, giving us better hardware with more qubits and better qubits. And what we do on our side, is that we try to get these algorithms that we know can provide speedups and advantages and find ways to, to, to implement them with less resources while keeping a better performance. The specific application that we will look at is in the field of machine learning and uh, more precisely in classification. So why quantum machine learning? Well, we think that quantum machine learning is a very good area where we can look for applications of quantum computers and in particular NISC machines. So why is that? The first reason is that we know that fault-tolerant big-scale big scale quantum computers can offer actually big advantages. There has been a lot of work uh, in the recent years about uh, this and a number of these algorithms actually come from, from um, our team. The second reason is that we have concrete avenues for bringing QML closer to reality. For example, what we will see uh, here in the talk and what we used in order to, to experimentally implement um, our, our classification algorithms is uh, quantum subroutines that have to do first with data loading. These are subroutines that take classical data and encode them as quantum states, which are important for the quantum algorithms afterwards. And second, uh, quantum circuits and quantum algorithms for distance estimation. This is again one fundamental uh, primitive in machine learning, which is used pretty much everywhere uh, in similarity learning. For example, for algorithms like k-nearest uh, neighbors, nearest centroid, support vector machines, and so forth. We also have uh, ideas on how to bring uh, even more impactful quantum tools like linear algebra closer to, to NISC uh, era. The third reason why we think that quantum machine learning is a very interesting area for quantum application is because noise is something that can actually be helpful in machine learning. Many times in classical machine learning, we inject artificially noise into our computations, first in order to make our algorithms more robust, and second even to, 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 to get some feeling of data privacy. So here we can use the noise which is inherent in the NISC machines actually to our advantage. This last reason I would like to, to discuss is that, you know, usually in machine learning we talk about efficiency and accuracy, but there are also some other properties that become more and more important. Things like interpretability, trust, energy savings, and these are things that quantum technologies can also help with. So let's look at our specific application, the quantum nearest centroid classifier. So the first step is to figure out our use case, and here we looked at classification. Here are some images that uh, represent different types of data sets. And I guess the goal of our use case is to classify these images into different categories. So now that we have our use case, what we need to do is design the quantum algorithm. We look at classification and we look at various different classical techniques for classification. You can see here things that have to do with similarity learning, like nearest centroid, k nearest neighbor, support vector machines, but also things that, and methods that have to do with deep learning, for example, convolution neural networks, uh, Boltzmann machines, etc. So from all these different uh, algorithms, we had to pick one, and we picked the nearest centroid, and there are quite a few reasons for that. It is not the best classifier out there, but it's a first classification milestone. It's also the cleanest way to test quantum machine learning subroutines within an application, and it's actually, we find, a very good uh, way to benchmark the quantum hardware. So what is the nearest centroid classifier? It's a pretty simple uh, algorithm. We have different types of uh, data points. Here uh, we have blue, green, and red points. And what we do when we want to fit the model is that we find the, the centroid, the barycenter of these points. In some sense, the average blue, green, and red point. And what we do is that when a new point comes into the system, this white dot which is there in the middle, we estimate the distance between this new point and the centroids from the different clusters, and we assign to the white point the label that corresponds to the nearest centroid, in our example, the green color. 
So when we want to start using quantum computing in order to, 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 to create an advantage for this problem, one step where we can do something quantumly is exactly in this computing the distances between the points and the centroids. Of course, we can do more quantum stuff. And for example, instead of estimating qu the quantumly the distance between the point and each one of the centroids, we can also think of uh, cases where we can have a superposition of these centroids and compute the distance in a more quantum way. These quantum ways can offer actually bigger uh, advantages, but also they need uh, better hardware. So the first step of, uh, the, of our uh, procedure is to build the quantum circuits. So the first thing we have to build is what we call the data loaders. These are quantum circuits that load n-dimensional classical data onto the quantum computer. So in order to do that, our solution is very simple. We first look at the classical data and map our data points to parameters uh, for the gates of this quantum circuit. This happens in linear time and only once. And once we do that, we actually can build quantum circuits that can create these quantum encodes of the data that we need. And they run, uh, very importantly, in log n steps, only logarithmic in the dimension of the data points. The gates that we use are the ones uh, defined below, which are actually quite useful for many different applications. So here is how the data loaders work in more generally. We define two types of data loaders, the parallel data loader that uses n qubits to encode n-dimensional data, but only log n depth, and the optimal number of n minus 1 two-qubit gates. But we can do something more, which is that we can optimize this trade-off between the qubits and the depth, and for example, have an optimized data loader that uses square root n qubits and square root n depth. The important thing about the data loaders is that once we, we encode our classical data into these quantum states, we can do efficiently very interesting operations. And one of the operations is actually this distance estimation. So here, what we need to do is, given data points x and y, we need to find their distance. And the circuits for finding the distance are pretty simple to explain now that we know how to load this, this uh, classical data into quantum states. In fact, the first half of the circuit is just the loader for the first input x, and the second half of the circuit is the adjoint circuit for the loader of the second data point. What we see here is that we have created shallow and very noise-robust circuits, and we will see about this noise-robustness later on in the talk. We use the same number of qubits n and only two times log n depth. And in fact, we can also use different types of loaders instead of the parallel one that we used here, for example, our optimized data loaders, to trade off between the qubits and the depth. Last, we can combine these loaders with amplitude estimation later on when the hardware will become better in order to, to reduce the number of um, samples that we need. Once we have the quantum circuits ready, we can now develop the software. Our goal is to make software that is very easy to use for classical data scientists. We generate clusters as you can do in your, uh, with a Python notebook uh, classically. And then we have a function, a fit and predict function, that calls this QNRS centroid uh, algorithm. And the same way as we can do it classically through, for example, one of the most popular classical machine learning libraries, the scikit-learn, where again, the same way we can uh, call the classical nearest centroid, we can pretty much call the quantum nearest centroid, and then we can see that we can print the quantum labels, which are very good because they're the same as the classical labels, and we can even plot uh, the results. Of course, what goes into this very classical and high-level fit and predict function is things like the distance estimation function that we discussed uh, before. The distance estimation function calls these loader circuits that we also discussed, and these loader circuits also have to have these efficient procedures for finding the parameters of the circuit. Overall, the idea is that very easily and with only some classical experience in data science, one can start using our algorithms very, very fast. So our technique can be used in other applications, not only classification. For example, we can use them to define neural networks that are at once disk but also have provable guarantees of performance. We can use them for regression and for clustering. And in order to recap and move on to the second part of the talk, what we saw here is that first we defined our use case and it was a classification. Second, we designed our quantum algorithm, the quantum nearest centroid algorithm. Then we built the quantum circuits 
for distance estimation and for loading the data. We developed the software. And now we are completely ready to start up hardware executions. And uh, Sonica Jody will tell us about how we implemented this on the Iron Q machines in the second part of the talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Iordanis, for the great talk on the theoretical part of our project. So hello, everyone. My name is Sonika Jori, and I'm a senior quantum applications researcher at IonQ. I will be talking about the experimental implementation of the quantum nearest centroid algorithm on IonQ quantum computers. Um, first, some uh, details on the nitty gritties of the experiment. Here we used our 11 qubit trapped ion quantum computer. The native gates on this system are single qubit rotations and maximally entangling molmer sorensen gates. The average two qubit gate fidelity accessible to typical, typical cloud users is more than 96%. And we tested four and eight qubit versions of the algorithm, which had 12 and 32 qubit gates respectively. Now, before running an algorithm on a real quantum computer, we always have to think about the effects of noise. Here, we used an unary encoding in which the number of qubits is equal to the dimension of the vector corresponding to each data point. The equation here uh, shows the form of the quantum state obtained at the end of the circuit execution. The algorithm requires the estimation of the coefficient of the first computational basis state in the superposition. However, due to noisy operations on a real quantum computer, the output will also have finite probability to produce a state that lies outside of the limited subspace shown here. So what does that mean in practice? Well, the output from the quantum computer is a histogram of probabilities corresponding to the coefficient shown in the last slide. One can, of course, calculate uh, A1 squared from the last slide directly from this histogram, as shown in the on, figure on the left here. On the other hand, one could also post-process this histogram to discard states that we already know lie outside the encoding subspace and calculate A1 squared after renormalizing the remaining probability distribution, as shown here on the right. We will see in the next slides that this second technique actually provides enormous increases in the accuracy of the algorithm. So first of all, here we show results from our first experiment where we artificially generated four and eight dimensional data with two or four clusters. On the bottom here, NC is the number of classes and NS is the number of shots. For each case, the blue bars on the left correspond to the results without error mitigation, and the red bars on the right correspond to the results with error mitigation. For two classes, we see that for the case of four-dimensional data, we achieve 100% accuracy, even with as little as 100 shots per circuit, and even without error mitigation. For the case of eight-dimensional data and two classes, we also achieve 100% accuracy once we apply error mitigation. We also performed experiments with four classes and reached accuracies up to 90% for the eight-dimensional case with error mitigation. Next, let's turn to a real-life data set. The IRIS data set consists of three classes of flowers with 50 samples from each of the three classes. Each data point has four dimensions that correspond to the length and width of the sepals and petals. This data set has been used extensively for benchmarking classification techniques in machine learning, in particular because classifying the set is not trivial. Even the classical near centroid algorithm, which is indicated, the accuracy of which is indicated by the dashed line over here, reaches accuracies of only around 93%, while our experiments on the quantum computer with only 500 shots and error mitigation reach almost 84% accuracy. The figure on the right here compares the classification visually before and after error mitigation. You can see that many of the points that lie close to midway between the centroids are originally misclassified, but applying the error mitigation moves them to the right class. Next, let's move to the MNIST database, which contains images of handwritten digits and is widely used as a benchmark for classification, alg as a benchmark for classification algorithms. Each image in the MNIST database is effectively a 784 dimensional point. In order to be able to work with this data set uh, on our eight qubit system, on, on uh, our 11 qubit system, we pre process the images using principal component analysis in order to project them into eight dimensions. 
We then created subsets of this data set as shown here, consisting of samples of either just zero, one, or two, or seven, or zero, one, two, three, or even all, all 10 digits. You can see here that after error mitigation, the quantum computer matches the accuracy of the classical classifier for all of the data sets tested. You should also know that this is the first time classification with four or 10 classes has been performed on a quantum computer, and the accuracies we see here are remarkable. Now, um, once we saw all of the promising experiment, experimental results, we wanted to analyze how the accuracy of the algorithm would behave as we increase the number of qubits. We, we realized that there are two kinds of errors that affect the algorithm. The first is an error which redistributes weight within the ideal density matrix and is resistant to our error mitigation technique. We were able to show that this error, however, grows only as log of the dimension of the data, which implies, for example, that if you want a desired accuracy of 10 to the power minus 2 in the distance estimation, the accuracies of the molnar sorensen gates can be 10 to the power minus 3 rather than 10 to the power minus 5, which would have been the case if the error grew with the number of gates. Secondly, we also have a depolarizing error, which redistributes weight from an ideal density matrix to a completely mixed state. This is the error which our error mitigation technique addresses. We found a lower bound on the fidelity beyond which the error mitigation technique gets more effective as the dimension of the problem increases. Since this fidelity bound is easily satisfied by trapped ion systems, we do not need to worry about this error as we scale up. And lastly, I would like to leave you with my conclusions. I showed you how the quantum nearest neighbor algorithm designed by QC Ware was implemented on IMQ systems and was successfully used to classify data sets with up to 10 classes with remarkable accuracy. One of the key design choices that allowed this success was the choice of a sparse encoding that allows for effective error mitigation. We are confident that with the 99% fidelity of INQ's newest two qubit, uh, 32 qubit system, we will be com competitive with classical classifiers, e even higher dimensional data sets. And lastly, by the time you watch this, uh, our paper with these results will already be on archive. Please be sure to take a look. Thank you.